have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture today, but hopefully as we look at it, God will give you insights as he's given me insights over the last couple of weeks. This is known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. For those of you who are visiting with us today or for those who haven't been here for a couple of weeks, we have been in a series entitled The Red Letters. The red letters are, we're going through and we're looking at some of the most prolific teachings of Christ that he shared in parables. Now, a parable is simply an earthly story with a heavenly punchline. It's, it's taking that which is familiar and explaining a truth, and an unfamiliar truth in, in, in a way that is not cryptic, but yet at the same time, it's something that you have to delve into to understand. You have to take some time to look at it. And so far, we've looked at parables like the prodigal son, the, 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 the grain of wheat. We've looked at the wheat and the tares, several different parables that Jesus spoke on earth. And most of these parables have dealt with our relationship with him. Well, that is also the case today in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, once you read with me. One day, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him a question. Teacher... What should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does, the, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied, you are correct. Do this and you will live. The man wanting to justify his actions then asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Next, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and with wine and bandaged them. But he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I'm here. Then Jesus looks at them and says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And the man replied, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said to him, now go and do likewise. You know, as with all parables, the key to understanding the parable is the context. I I don't know about you, but whenever I read a parable, I'm drawn to the story. I'm drawn to what's being said, and sometimes I sit scratching my head going, now what was he trying to say? This is is no more true than with this parable. It's so easy to get drawn to the question, who is my neighbor? But that's the wrong question to focus on here. There are two questions asked. The first, what shall I do to have eternal life? That is the context of this parable. And if you miss this, you miss the meaning of the parable. And and I'll be honest with you. I have read, I have talked about, I have shared this parable. I don't know how many times in the last 30 years of ministry. But it wasn't until the last two weeks that all of a sudden the light bulb came on. And I went, wow. It wasn't that I missed a teaching. It's just I did miss the message. And what I believe that Jesus was trying to say here is absolutely staggering. I think it's absolutely profound for every one of us in this room. Because when you begin to pull it apart, you understand that Jesus was really coming to address this man's 
issues, his heart, his question. And even though there were a bunch of people around him listening, Jesus laser focused on this man and said, you really want to answer this question? Let me tell you. In this parable, what we have is the good Samaritan, this individual who represents what we're all to be like if we have genuine faith. The question though is, do we have genuine faith? And so the Good Samaritan isn't about being neighborly. The Good Samaritan is about what shall I do to have eternal life? And I love it because in the story, Jesus comes, this, this guy who's an expert in the law. It wasn't that he was an attorney. He was, he, he was maybe a Pharisee or a Sadducee. He was someone who had, who was upstanding, who People, even the religious people came to him and asked him for advice, asked him for clarity about, about what the law of Moses said. And so when he comes, the scripture actually says that he was coming to trick or catch Jesus in a, in a theological misstep. So he asked the question, what must I do to have eternal life? And I love Jesus' response. Did you notice what Jesus did? He didn't go, well, this is what you do. He says, you tell me. You tell me. And the guy reciting from two passages of Scripture in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and Leviticus 19, 8, 18, says, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. And I love it. Jesus goes, ding, 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 ding. You got it. You are correct. That is the right answer. And the truth is that the guy would have said, okay, great, and went along his way. We would, know, we, would, we would all be no wiser for what we're getting ready to learn. But what we learn from this guy is he says, then who is my neighbor? He was wanting to justify his lifestyle. He was wanting to justify his interpretation of the law and the prophets. And that's when Jesus unloads with this parable. Now, I want, you to, I want you to grasp this. I want you to get this because this is incredibly significant. He asked the question. Jesus gives the answer. But his question reveals something that I think most of us miss that's incredibly applicable to us. I go around all the time and I'll have conversations with people and I'll have people say, how can I know if I have a relationship with God? I'll have people come to me and say, how can, I have, how can I have eternal life? It happens all the time. And almost every time I will say, you tell me. And they'll say, well, I have to pray and invite Jesus into my life. Great, you are correct. But what we learn from this man's second question reveals his understanding of the first question or his first answer. Do you see it? This man answered Jesus correctly with his words but missed God in his heart. Churches are filled with people who can give a correct answer but still have missed God. That's what he's talking about here in this parable. And what he's going to say, here's the spoiler, here's the punchline. He says, if you have a correct understanding of God, then you will love your neighbor the way God loves your neighbor. It will show up in your activity. It will show up in your relationships. But if you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then you're going to treat other people in a way that Jesus wouldn't treat them. It doesn't mean you're going to treat them badly. It just means you're going to treat them for selfish gain. But when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, let me, let me explain what that means. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength means that you have put your faith in God, that he is 
the one and only God, that he exists, that he has given his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for your sin. And by faith, you have received that. And it's a spiritual transaction that, ha that has taken place in your heart and in your heart and in your mind that leads to a changed life, a changed focus. You no longer live for yourself, but for him. And so when God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, what he's really saying is, when you put your faith in me and there's been a real transaction and I have taken over the, the throne of your heart, it is going to show up in your actions towards other people. See, the true measure of the validity of your faith is how we treat other people in Jesus' name. You could say it this way. If you have a correct vertical relationship with God, it will have an impact on all your horizontal relationships for God. If you don't have a vertical relationship with God, then your horizontal relationships are all gonna be all about you. And so he comes to him, he says, listen, it's not enough to say, who is my neighbor? The real question here is not who is my neighbor, but because of your faith, what kind of neighbor are you? Did you catch it? What kind of neighbor are you? That's, that's really what's going on in this text. So let's, let's, let's look at the content very quickly and, and discuss a couple of things that I think are, are, are relevant to us today from this text. Let's kind of review the parable. A man goes on a journey. He's traveling a dangerous road. He's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And along the road, he's attacked by bandits. He's beaten. He's robbed. He's left dead, basically half dead. He's, he's at the brink of death. First, a Levite comes by, I mean, a priest comes by, a leader in the temple, a, per, a man who makes sacrifices, someone who is supposedly committed to leading other people to God. He comes by, looks and sees the situation, and continues on. Then one of his associates comes along, sees the same situation, and he says, you know what, I, I don't have time for this, or I'm too good for this, and he goes on his way. And, it, and just by chance, a Samaritan, and Jesus was so precise in what he was trying to accomplish here. He was taking those that were religious and, and basically said they didn't care. And he took the one person in that society that was the most despised, the most hated, and he uses him as the hero of the story. I can promise you that caused the, the listener, this, 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 this religious leader, it caused his blood to boil. He says, and this Samaritan, this half-breed, the Jew, Gentiles didn't like them, the Jews didn't like them because they had intermarried, they were considered the scum of the earth, these low life, this low life Samaritan, he comes by, sees the situation, and has compassion. And he doesn't just have compassion, he goes over, he tends to the man, he, 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 heal, he, he puts oil and and and. and Balm on his wounds. He wraps him up. He then puts him on his own donkey. Now, this is a 17-mile trip that's going from 3,000, 3,300 feet down to sea level, actually below sea level. And he puts the man on his own donkey and walks. Gets to the bottom, goes to an inn, puts the man in the inn and says, okay, I need you to take care of him. I've got to go do business. Will you I'm going to give you two extra silver coin when I come back if you owe anything. I mean, this guy goes all out. You ready for this? No strings attached. And the innkeeper takes him in, apparently cares for him. And then Jesus says, which one of these is the neighbor? When Jesus offered this story, trust me when I tell you, every single person listening understood what he was talking about. That trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, that 3,300 elevation drop, 17 mile, was called the way of blood. 
the terrain was very rocky. It was a very narrow path in some places. It weaves in and out of the, of the mountains and crevices. And it was a great place for bandits to come. And it was not uncommon for murderers and thugs to come and to take advantage of people. And everyone in that society knew it. Every one of them. So when Jesus shares this, they're like going, okay, we get this. In fact, for all they knew, it, 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 was, it was something that really happened. But Jesus wasn't focused on the man who was injured because that wasn't the point of the story. Jesus was concerned about all the other people in the story and how they related to it. As I started thinking about that, you know, with most parables, you have a primary message and then you have a secondary message. The primary message, for example, with the prodigal son is that the older brother, that's really the focus of that parable, if you remember. But yet we learn so much from the younger brother. We learn everything about repentance from the younger brother. And, and, and that's a powerful lesson. The same thing's true here. The focus of the story is on how do I know if I have eternal life? How can I have eternal life? It's about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But there's a very powerful secondary message. And I think it has to do with every one of us. Because in this story, how many types of neighbors are there? Count them. It's a trick question. We would all say, oh, it's three, a priest, a Levite, and Samaritan. And I would submit to you, no, there's not. There's five. There are five types of neighbors in this story. Jesus hones in on three of them, but they're really five types of neighbors, and they represent four types of people. And I promise you that every one of us in this room, we're one of these types of people. But if we have authentic faith, we should be like the last one. It doesn't mean that if you have authentic faith, you can't be like any of these others, because I have seen people who are Christians who act this way at times. It's just not their default. But the first one, the first type of neighbor are robbers. Have you ever had someone in your life that when they come through your life and they pass through, you feel like you've been beaten up? You feel like you've been abused? I mean, these, these people, they're, they're users, abusers, and accusers. They come through and there's like a whirlwind and, and when they pass, it's been a bloodbath. They have taken, they have stolen, they have treated you horribly. Am, am, I, am I the only person that's ever had that experience? Well, apparently not. Now here's the thing about these neighbors. They're all about self-indulgence. They're all about gratifying and satisfying themselves. And they will do whatever it takes to get what they want. And the truth is, many times you can't stop them unless you avoid the situation completely. But I can assure you of this, if they've passed through their life, the chances of you being victimized are great. And here's the thing about it. Sometimes these robbers live in your community. Sometimes they work with you in your company. Many times, they are in your family. And sometimes, you see them when you look in the mirror. But make no bones about it. There are neighbors who are robbers. And what they take leaves us bankrupt. The second type of robber, the second type of, of, of neighbor that I see in the story of the religious. This would include the priest and Levite. Now, before you jump on them, before you think, oh, I know about these people, you need to, you, you need to be patient because you and I might just be some of these people. Let me explain. The priest and the, and the Levite, in all likelihood, they had a relationship with God. They knew who God was. 
They certainly performed all the, the rituals. They, they were trying to lead the people in discovery. But when they came to the situation, one of two things caused them to do what they did. Number one, they thought they were too good for the situation. Now, you may think, well, they would, I can get that. I, I'm religious, I'm pious, and these people are beneath me. I don't know that it was that simple. I, I think it was really more about the fact that as a temple priest, he had to remain culturally unclean. He had to be, be clean. And so every time he'd go to the temple, he would wash, he would go through all these, these ceremonies to make himself clean. For him to go over and to help this Samaritan, or help this Jewish man that, was, that had been beaten up, would cause him to become unclean. See, he had a wrong understanding of what it meant to be, what it meant to be clean before God. He was banking on earthly traditions instead of upon the grace and favor of God. And we do that. We have our traditions. We have our, our bogus religious ideology that causes us to think that if I engage in this, that it may cause separation between me and God. When the truth is, as Christians, how are we supposed to live our lives? Under the leading of the voice of God. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's a very, very slippery slope. And as I say this, I'm not giving anyone a license. Everybody say, I have no license here. Say it out loud. But here's the deal. If in your Christian life, God tells you to go to a bar for the sake of the gospel, do you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to go where God told you to go. Now, carefully noted, some of you may think God told you to go to a bar when he didn't. So don't put words in God's mouth. But if God lays on, convicts you to go and engage, you have to do it but you just gotta make sure it's God. And remember this, God will never speak contrary to his word. I'm gonna try to be careful, I, I, I see a couple of kids. I don't know if you all saw this week, but there was actually an article about a family, a, a husband and wife, who were swinging in Jesus' name. They said God told them to go do that. It was the best way for them to minister to them. That is hogwash. That's not remotely close. You cannot break God's word to do things that you want to do in God's name. You get that? All right, just want to make sure we're clear there. But yet if God tells you to do something and it's not sin and it lines up with his word, then there's a good chance that God's telling you to do that. And if he does it, you go do it. Got it? Good. All right. So what happens to the religious guys? So the first one is they thought they were too good for the situation or, and this is where we all get in trouble, they were too busy. They didn't have time. Interesting study done a couple of years ago at Princeton University. They brought in a group of seminary students and they asked them, why are you called to the ministry? Why do you feel called to the ministry? And every single one of them, one of the top three answers was because we want to help people. So then they pulled them over to a room, they talked to them about ministry, and they actually shared with them the parable of the Good Samaritan. They spent some time talking about it, and then they broke them into three groups, unbeknownst to them. They brought them all into a room, and they said, hey, here's the, here's the situation. And the three groups, the three groups were high hurry, intermediate hurry, and low hurry. So they bring the guys in one at a time. It'd be like I called Cal in after meeting with this big group and I would say, you know what? We thought you had a great understanding of the Good Samaritan. We've, aligned, we've set up an opportunity for you to go cross campus and one of the, one of the religious, religion classes is being taught. We've set up for you to go and speak to this class about the story of the Good Samaritan. Now the high hurry group, they said, you were supposed to be there five minutes ago. The intermediate group, they said, you have, you have a 10 minute walk and it's 15 minutes away, you better hurry. 
And then the low hurry group, they said, you got an hour till you have to be there, but once you begin making your way over there. Now, unbeknownst to these seminary students, along the different paths that they could take were actors who all were in desperate situations, crying out, screaming out, doing whatever they could do to get the attention of people. And what they discovered is that nine out of 10 people, these seminary students, called to the ministry, who said, I'm in the ministry to help people, nine out of 10 in the high hurry group did not stop. In fact, there were reports that over half of them literally stepped over top of the situation. Nine out of 10. Interestingly enough, in the group that was a low hurry, six out of 10 stopped which shows us how detrimental busyness is to ministry. Folks, if this is one issue that you and I have, we are so stinking, stinking busy. It's ridiculous. We have made no time to spend time with God. We make no time to, to serve God, whether it's through the local church or in your community. And sometimes even we have made time, instead of, being, instead of being ministry, we start doing functional stuff and we're just occupying time. We're looking for something to keep us busy. And we no longer are focused on how can I be used for God. Instead, it's just how can I occupy my time? I, I don't know that this is an American phenomenon, but I do know it's a bad problem in America. Folks, if you're too busy for God, you're too busy. And I'll be, I'm the chief of sinners. With four kids, married, baseball, dance, therapies, you name it. I, I, sometimes I see myself coming or going. Busyness. I think that was the real, I think that may have been one of the real issues for them. So, are you a robber? Are you the religious? Are you like the innkeeper? And it's all about receiving. I, I look at the, this, this guy, and this may be unfair, but I don't think it is. But in reflecting on the innkeeper, I think we find a person who was willing to help the situation, but there were strings attached. I'm willing to help, but what's in it for me? I know people that will say, I literally have had people in churches where I pastored who've said, I go to church, but they don't go to church for God. They don't go to church to be a part of the community. They go to church because it's gonna help their business. It gives them relationships. It gives them a chance, an insurance guy, a, a financial planner, you name it. And those aren't, I mean, there's doctors. You can, you can give the field, but there are people that they go to church so that people will like them and possibly do business with them. I think the innkeeper shows us that, yes, I'm willing to help, but only if it helps me. And what Jesus would say of the innkeeper is, I'm glad he's willing to help, but genuine faith doesn't do it with strings attached. Genuine faith is more like the last one. So you have the robbers, you have the religious, you have the receivers, or then you have the responsive. You have those who have a right relationship with God. They do love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And it's not just about salvation, it's about their intimacy with God. They walk with God. They, they, have, they have relationship with God. They, they engage with God. It's not about doing religious exercise. It's about pursuing Intimacy and knowledge of God. They're growing in width. They're growing in depth. And as they grow in the relationship with God, God continually unfolds opportunities for them to be Jesus to the people around them. Let me assure you of this. When you start walking with God, when he is your priority, when he sits on the throne of your life, there is going to be no shortage of opportunities for you to be his hands and his feet because God orchestrates them. 
Trust me when I tell you, he would rather someone who knows God intimately to engage a person at the point of their need than to have someone who doesn't know God at all to engage someone at the point of their need. Because in all circumstances, God wants to use them to draw us to know him and to serve him and to walk with him. What better representative for the hands and the feet of God are those people who engage, who are sold out, and God will continually give you those opportunities. I promise. I promise you that's what he'll do. He's looking for those who will say, I'm willing to serve God because God first loved me. No strings attached. Now, don't miss this. The context of this story was how can you know? How can you know if you have a relationship with God? How can you know you have eternal life? And Jesus says, if you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, the way you're going to know that you have that is that you will love your neighbor, not just as yourself, but the way that I love them, the way that I care for them. I wonder today, as you hear this, how many of you would say, you know, I, I have been focused on being a good person. And you may be a great person. But whether you're good or great, that has no bearing on your relationship with God. Your, your relationship with God, my relationship with God, it's based on what God has done for us, not what we can do for God. As we look at this parable, we see that's what he's trying to teach this expert in the law. If you want eternal life, by faith, you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if it takes, then it'll show up in your earthly relationships. So whether you're a robber, whether you're religious, whether you're a receiver who's in it for himself, when God gets your heart, it changes everything. What does your neighborliness say about your faith? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your amazing truth, for your patience and your gentleness. Lord, I, I'm overwhelmed at how loving and gentle Jesus was to that man who was trying to catch him. Instead of confronting this guy, he, he gives him the truth to turn this man's heart towards him. Father, in this room today, I know that there are men and women, there are people here today that they're banking their eternity on their goodness. They're banking their eternity on how good of a neighbor they are. And Lord, I believe today that what you've shown us is that the question is not, are you a good neighbor? The question is, do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Have you put your faith in him? It reminds me of the passage in James, Lord, where you tell us that our, our, our works don't produce our faith, but rather our faith produces our works. Lord, my prayer today for all of us, whether we've never come into a relationship with God or whether we have and we're not walking the way we should, is today that you would use this passage to bring us to you. Thank you, Father, for your love and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with me? Let me tell you what we're getting ready to do. We're gonna have a, an invitation now, our invitations are, are done in a couple of ways here. One is in your bulletin or in the seat back in front of you, there's a piece of paper that you can say, you know, you can write your name and you can check a box 
and say, today I made this decision. This is how I'm responding to God. It's also an opportunity for you if you have a prayer request, which our prayer team and our staff take very seriously. If you have a prayer request, you can complete that. And then the boxes as you leave out of our sanctuary, the little brown boxes, you can drop those in there. And then we'll follow up with you as a staff. Another opportunity you have is at this moment. You can come down to the front. This is a safe place. It's a place for you to pray. If you want to talk with one of our pastors, we would love to talk with you and and help you with whatever is going on in your heart and your mind. But it's a chance for you to respond as God's speaking to you right now.